Uh, Tilman Altenberg, uh, as many of you will know, is head of the Department for Sustainable Economic and Social Development at the German Development Institute. He has a long background in industrial policy, innovation policy, and competitiveness, having worked in, in uh, well, all around the world, in South America, in Asia, in Africa, uh, and has uh, a, a long and uh, well-documented expertise in precisely this area. So it gives me great pleasure to pass over to Tillman mm -hmm. to talk about green industrial policy. Okay. Thank you very, very much, Will, for this very friendly introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. You see here two names. Uh, Anna Pegels is one of my colleagues and co-author of the, of the report. Or she has written two of the chapters. Um, she doesn't, didn't make it now to the meeting because she's presenting at, at Oxford um, this afternoon, and she's on her way here. So maybe she will join us for the discussion. Um, so this is not moving. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll try it. Okay, so I'll do it from here. Um, so a, a little bit of background on the report. The report is a joint report of um, a UN PAGE. PAGE means Partnership for Action on Green Economy. That is a, um, one UN type of endeavor for, um, which was created after the last Rio conference with the aim of uniting the work of, of uh, uh, those UN agencies that somehow work on green economy. And uh, so there's UN Environment, for example, and UN Industrial Development Organization. And of course, they have slightly kind of differing views because the, of the background they're coming from. ILO is part of it, so they're particularly interested in, in green jobs, etc. So the, uh, the task uh, of this report was to bring these different UN perspectives uh, together and, and base them on a, on a solid kind of academic uh, foundation. So we were uh, basically subcontracted by these agencies to, to co-develop the report with the, with the agencies. And I think that in itself is an interesting process because regardless of the quality of the content or so, um, just um, to have this kind of um, discussion among, among the UN agencies and this uh, struggle for kind of joint views on whether decoupling is, is compatible with latecomer industrialization, etc. Um, that in itself, I think, was a valuable exercise. So what the report does is what uh, Achim Steiner here said. It's basically, it tries to, um, to highlight how countries can use green industrial policy to promote, on the one hand, higher productivity and competitiveness, which is the old agenda of industrial policy, and on the other hand, incre increasing resource efficiency and, and decoupling economic growth from environmental degradation. So um, that's what we try to do, and that's what we envisage at the beginning of the process, that um, we, we had the impression that the discussion is still pretty much in silos in a way, that many people from an environmental side talk about uh, green transformation, and the industrial policy debate, which is about latecomer development, upgrading, creating competitive advantage, middle income trap. I mean, Slavo was one of the champions of that the debate here. Um, so so um, uh, that has never really been merged, and that was basically what we wanted to achieve with this report. So the challenge is this, um, to do productivity enhancing structural transformation uh, with the green transformation in, in, in in a synchronized way, and the target audience, the report covers industrialized countries and developing countries, but the main target audience are policymakers in developing countries, uh, where we um, felt that if we talk to policymakers in ministries of trade and industry in Africa or Latin America, for example, they still regard greening as an OECD luxury debate that is not really kind of relevant to their countries. And, um, and we wanted to kind of challenge a bit that, that wide, uh, widely held uh, perception. So um, many of you uh, know, know this graph here, which is by the Global Footprint Network, which basically says, uh, as here, um, 
the degree of um, uh, the, the human development index and it has on the other side um, the, uh, uh, the bio capacity per person that means how much resources per capita are being used and what it basically says is that there are countries that are within the planetary boundaries in terms of resource consumption so they are living in a sustainable way but then unfortunately they are very poor and they are not reaching kind of minimum standards of, 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 uh, of human development whereas those that are kind of materially well off and kind of achieving a high human development index are all of them are above the threshold that is sustainable so what we would like to see is a development where um, people converge to, uh, towards this uh, bottom quadrant here on the on the right and none of the countries is there that means for what we need to achieve there's no role mo model in the world and what we see in de facto is basically this this trend here and um, so expressed in a different visualized in a different way the world is now kind of consuming one and a half planets and, uh, and, and on a business as usual tra trajectory by 2050 we will consume more than two planets and obviously we need to really have a, a disruption of these pathways here so um, now while um, material consumption and ecological footprint are, are growing, wealth creation is, is slow in some parts of the world. One might say, okay, looking at the period 2000 to 2012 or 15, we had fairly high growth rates throughout the, throughout the developing world. Poverty rates have been declining substantially. Um, uh, human development has, has uh, uh, um, index has increased in almost all countries. Um, so we are fine with regard to wealth creation, right? That, that could be the first uh, impression that we get. But on the other hand, what we still have is 1.9 billion people living on less than $3.1 a day. So poverty is still widespread. And in addition to this, what is alarming is that Productivity enhancing structural transformation has slowed down in many regions. So people discussing industrial policies, structural, structural transformation, are pretty much concerned about what, what they observe. What we see in, in Africa and uh, MENA in Latin America is what Danny Roderick has called premature deindustrialization. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, w which means that they are not industrializing their, the structural transformation that usually you would assume that to enhance, to create wealth, countries need to move into high productivity uh, activities. So productivity should increase within each of the areas where people are currently earn their living. But the stronger and long-term driver is structural transformation whereby people move from low income, low productivity sectors like street vending and, and small scale farming and, and, and so on, uh, unproductive types of agriculture into manufacturing or into modern services. So that basically that has been the main driver of wealth creation in the past. And we see that, this, um, that the global patterns are changing. So countries are deindustrializing already at a level where they are not, 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 uh, not yet really industrialized. And then um, looking at those countries that have been kind of industrializing quite successfully, Asian countries for example, what we clearly see here is also that um, many of them are kind of um, hitting a ceiling in a way, where, which has been called the middle income trap, where the transition from a factor-based extensive growth by just adding factors of production, uh, no longer kind of um, no longer provides for for growth Im impulses, and the transition to knowledge-based pathways is is uh, uh, in a way uh, not happening. <coughs> and then, in addition, what we also observe is that we have labor-saving technologies, and we have globalization as two <coughs> trends, which uh, both in a way attempt against latecomer industrialization or latecomer structural transformation because uh, labor saving technologies, you may have seen the studies by Osborne and Fry and others who have shown 
that um, about half of the um, tasks that people in the US in that case, in the World Development uh, Report last said, uh, it's also the case in developing countries, that like about half of the tasks that people perform can be automated away in the next um, a decade or a decade and a half, right? And if that happens, basically, <coughs> a task is not a job, but still kind of uh, the automation potential seems to be enormous. And um, so that, that uh, creates a, a f quite bleak picture for, for, for latecomer industrialization. This is basically what Danny Roderick describes as, uh, as um, premature deindustrialization, where he says, historically, countries <coughs> reached a, a fairly high level of industrialization before they kind of the, the share of manufacturing went down. Uh, here it's employment, but whether you have employment or manufacturing value added doesn't make a big difference. But uh, there's a peak at which countries then start to move as into a tertiary economies, uh, service-led uh, economies. And what we, you see nowadays in developing countries post-1990 is that this peak is much lower and it starts at, at much earlier, uh, um, uh, uh, at, at much lower levels of income. So countries <coughs> deindustrialize basically before they have really started to industrialize. So the key question then that this raises is, is it possible for developing countries to go green without sacrificing development, right? And um, or asking in another way, uh, turning the question a bit around, can the green transformation accelerate productivity growth and wealth creation? Now, um, the next big message that we want to convey with the report, and by the way, there are some, the report, oops, oh yeah, yeah, sorry, the report is still in print, but um, um, it's, it's online available on the UN website and all the UN member websites. And I have a few kind of uh, summaries here and the first conceptual chapters, etc. cetera, print out for those who are interested. Um, so what we want to convey with the report is that green economic transformation is underway. When we talk to African stakeholders, for example, I presented that thing at the African Economic Conference in December and, and what people from ministries of trade and industry said is basically is that we don't see any greening of our economies happening. That may be something that happens in the OECD world, but until it reaches out, up us, that will take 20 years. So it's not really our business. No? That was a kind of typical thing. And, and uh, so we, we stressed very much that the green economic transformation is underway. And uh, here are a few kind of facts. One is in the energy sector, you clearly see that um, where the global investments are going. The global investments, this is the global investments in fossil energy uh, investments, and this is kind of uh, the, the investments in re renewable energy infrastructure. And as you see in renewables, uh, from in within 14 years, it has kind of gone up from 10% from of the energy, or 18% or whatever in the, of the energy investment to much more than than half of it, almost 60%, and it's a really steep increase. Now we can easily envisage that uh, the uh, investments in fossil fuel power plants uh, will kind of um, uh, disappear or, or get to kind of very, very low levels within a short period of time. So the transformation is happening. That's the good news. The bad news, of course, is the stocks change only slowly no? because you have all the invested <laughs> power plant plants of the last 30, 40 years still operating. But this transition is, is fairly unique in, in economic history, I would say. Then, um, and this is not only something that happens in the OECD world, it's also happening in, in developing countries. So 2015 was the first year when it, more, than, more investments in renewable energy were made in the developing world than <coughs> in, the, in the industrialized world with China and India in the lead. And um, just to give you the example of the Indian solar mission, which is an incredible success story. They started basically from zero gigawatts of, of solar power generation in, when was it, 2012 uh, or so, 
and, um, and uh, set the targets by to, for 2022 of uh, uh, 20 gigawatts or 22 gigawatts. And then um, it was so successful that basically they revised the target upwards to 75 because they all almost reached the target. And um, um, this was achieved through a very aggressive kind of tendering strategy. When they started the tenders, the cost of solar energy was uh, 27 euro cents per kilowatt hour. And now they are at four. So just through a kind of aggressive bidding and through economies of scale and implementation of projects. So this is an enormous uh, success story. And if you look at the NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, they're basically the roadmaps that countries uh, committed to in the Paris process, 48 developing countries committed to 100% renewable energy goals. So this, this change is happening. If you look at the transport sector, it starts from a very low basis, electrification of, 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 of vehicles. Still, you don't see electric vehicles driving around in London, but um, the growth is, is clearly exponential. And, um, and uh, what you also see is that um, the, 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 the costs of key ingredients are, are going down. Um, this is what call, what's called Swanson's Law, which means that <coughs> with a doubling in, in production, you reach economies of scale which bring the costs down. With each doubling, you, you achieve a 20% reduction of prices. And this is how prices have come down for, for PVs, uh, photovoltaic panels. This is how they are coming down for uh, lithium-ion electric batteries. And um, once you go kind of, um, you bring costs down to parity with the polluting substitutes, um, the market takes off, right? And this has been achieved for wind energy, it has been achieved for many regions, solar energy, and uh, the predictions that electric vehicles will be kind of cost competitive uh, with uh, um, internal combustion engine vehicles are kind of uh, very optimistic, so we will soon be there. If you look at environment-related patent applications, you also see the increases. If you look at organic um, uh, uh, organic foods, you see huge increases. So there are certain markets where um, the, the transition has clearly picked up. And then what we also see as a big driver of change is that companies, big multinationals, um, like all those here, all those uh, multinationals, including all the, most of the energy multinationals, are the ones that uh, that ask the negotiators in the Paris uh, Agreement for a carbon price. So, so they see, okay, they're committed in a way. What we want to have is certainty about the, the future, but we, are, we, we can live with a carbon price. And that's, so, so the companies, including the big energy utilities, are some, some, somehow ahead of many of the policy makers and, and, and governments. And you see trends like uh, that people see the risks of carbon bubbles. So if you have to devaluate all your assets in, in, um, in, uh, in oil stocks, your assets in, in, um, uh, in fossil fuel power plants, etc., this can create a financial bubble. And that's why international regulators like the Financial Stability Board are now um, uh, developing financial disclosure rules for companies. So it becomes um, an incentive that uh, guides the investment behavior. Then there are also some areas where we don't see change happening. And, um, and that's mostly because for, for lack of, of regulation and, and or lack of credibility of future regulations. Like for example, kerosene uh, still cannot be taxed due to an, uh, an international treaty in the, uh, that is like uh, 50 or 60 years old. And um, um, so, so certain things, in certain things you don't see, see move. Um, okay, now let's turn to the topic of industrial policy. What, what has industrial policy to do with this, this transformation? 
And um, so what I want to uh, lay out here is, is two steps, basically, what is good industrial policy? And I keep that fairly, fairly short. And then how is green industrial policy different from industrial policy business as usual, industrial policy as we have uh, discussed it in the past? And it's, it's also interesting to look at, even here, the, the silo thinking of people. If you look at most of the, the books on, on industrial policy that have been published in the f last five or six years, they have no, no green chapter in it, as if the green transformation wouldn't happen. And um, um, so, so that again underlines the importance of, of bringing these debates together. So what we see is the, the world economy is shifting away from a world run on fossil fuels and resource depletion and the, the increasingly felt consequences of environmental crisis are likely to accelerate this, this, this change even further. If we look at how the discourse about decarbonization has changed in the last 10 years, I think it's, it's enormous. It's still not rapid enough, but um, um, now it's a mainstream topic and it wasn't uh, uh, 10 years ago. So the key message here in a way is that smart industrial policy is about anticipating future markets and adapting to them. And So if, if you know that the world goes digital and you don't adapt to it, or if you kn know that the growth markets are in electronics and you don't adapt to it, or you see that the growth markets are in, in, in green technologies and you don't adapt to it, it's basically a stupid policy making. And um, so what, what is industrial policy in our de definition? It's kind of basically uh, all sets of measures that governments use to influence a country's economic structure in the pursuit of a desired objective. No, that can be job creation, that can be, um, uh, some definitions say in, in the pursuit of productivity growth. But some, like Krugman, for example, define it a bit more broadly, because de facto, if you look at what drives EU policy making or so, there are lots of normative things in it. It's not just productivity growth and competitiveness, but it's also jobs, it's about lagging regions, so, so there are kind of societal uh, uh, topics built in, right? So that's the way of, of uh, how we would define industrial policy. And then this key objection, Will mentioned it in his uh, opening remarks here, that there is, uh, industrial policy is, is uh, you shouldn't pursue industrial policy. It's still kind of a widespread message among mainstream economists and conservative uh, government people, etc., because government should not pick winners market are better at identifying promising business opportunities. And they are right. I mean, in, 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 in a way, um, uh, old-fashioned industrial policy where governments in the Soviet Union, for example, told uh, kind of um, market actors, uh, we need, you know, you need to fulfill those targets and those sectors, etc. This has, has always, always failed and markets are smart allocation principle, right? So, so one should <coughs> recognize that, but that's not the type of industrial policy that we envisage. The counter argument is firstly that uh, the case for correcting market failure is undisputed. In theory, it's, there's no doubt about, the, um, uh, about uh, lots of different uh, origins or sources of market failure. Environmental externalities here are obvious examples, but also coordination failure. If you want to really envisage a transition from a fossil fuel energy system, for example, to a renewable energy system, it, it requires all sorts of coordinations. No? And incentive systems, uh, laws have, been, have to be changed. You need to have uh, grids, you need to manage uh, the, 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 the grids, you need to have, have new power infrastructure, you need to have um, whatever, um, uh, demand side managen, management, etc. This goes far beyond what one individual investor would, would do. So basically you have that kind of coordination pro pro problem that um, unless it is an, an investor knows that the complementary things that are necessary to get the system running are also undertaken, nobody invests, right? And, um, and there are other, other market failures. But then there's the other argument is also, I think, which is not often overlooked. So you wouldn't find it in most economic textbooks or so is that the societal optimum is not necessarily the market optimum. So you can optimize, you can have a kind of Pareto optimality or so in, in theory, 
But then if, if you look at what societies really want, it's not necessarily the same. Equity, justice, things, for example, matter for people, or risk perceptions. Um, Germans or French or uh, uh, US citizens or Koreans or Japanese have different views on, for example, whether they think nuclear energy is a desirable, desirable alternative or not. No? Because um, there's a trade-off between carbon emissions and nuclear risks, and people have different perceptions of that. That means that there is no one ops kind of optimal pathway where you can have an equation and say this is the way to go, but it's a kind of societal um, negotiation <coughs> process where people say we want a future with GMO, with genetically modified uh, or organisms or without, um, with nuclear or without, with whatever, with deregulated cinemas or regulated cin cin cinemas, whatever. If you ask a US or French citizens, they would clearly have different views, views on these things, right? And um, so it's a, it's a matter of social so consensus building that goes far beyond, so it's a, um, beyond kind of a uh, um, purely economic optimum. So uh, taking this into account, this is a quite longish discussion, the, the, the definition of what we perceive as industrial policy. And it's something about facilitating stakeholder dialogues on the broad direction of structural change, moderating different view, viewpoints, fun, finding compromises, creating consensus, and, uh, and then adapting regulatory frameworks and incentive schemes such that creative entrepreneurial search processes are encouraged and channeled towards the achievement of agreed goals. This is very different from Soviet type uh, top-down planning, right? And um, um, so th that's the notion of, but it's also very different from a laissez-faire uh, economic policy making, right? So, so that's the, con the perception, the understanding that we have with Danny Roderick, et cetera, who contributed to the, the report also. On, on, on what we think is, is modern industrial policy. Now, there are m risks of misallocation and political capture, but these risks of misallocation, they are not unique to industrial policy. They are, they are in, in health policy and, and, and everywhere. And the m argument that we make is uh, the biggest failure would not to try to steer market behavior in, in any way. And uh, the, the risks, they are there, but they are manageable. And it ha depends on how you design your industrial policies. And there are some principles here. I mean, uh, um, co-design with the firms. Don't kind of impose <coughs> things on firms. Um, uh, seek compulsory co-financing by the beneficiaries to make sure that it basically you get a market signal, uh, have sunset clauses, and, and so on and so on. Have competition and service provision. So it's, it's a matter of how you design these things. Now. The question is, what is then green industrial policy? What is conceptually different if you talk about green industrial policy? And those who have been in Thailand, I'm sure I know this T-shirt that everyone wears, same, same, but different. Um, so in a way, many things are same, same. The principles are same, same, but other things are different. And we see kind of six additional challenges that green industrial policy needs to cope with. The first is, to internalize environmental costs. I mean, that's the key issue why we want to, to green. So we need to have environmental tax reforms. We need to have possibly a, a carbon price for the cap and trade systems, fossil fuel subsidies sub, um, um, uh, phase out, which are basically the things that, that distort incentives in a way that people don't care about their, uh, their carbon footprint or their, their environmental footprint more broadly. Um, and um, so many economists, for example, in Germany, we have a big debate now between the Liberal Party that says, do away with all these feed-in tariffs that the Green Party wants. What we need to have is a carbon price, and basically that <coughs> signals to investors where, where to go. And I think in ter terms of economic theory, that is a, a valid proposition. Um, in mostly, because there are some other market failures, R&D, etc. But, but, but in, in principle, the, the, the Liberal Party is right. But in reality, there are a lot of political economy challenges for, for um, t environmental tax reforms and cap and trade systems. Um, for example, the, 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 it's, it's very difficult to get this, um, sufficiently 
uh, high prices for, 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 for carbon. And, um, and then we looked at a bit of evidence and, uh, and <coughs> recommended that cap, cap and trade systems are more complex to implement and environmental tax systems um, are mostly more suitable, easier to implement, particularly for developing countries. The idea here is that you tax environmental bads, so you tax pollution, but you keep the whole thing revenue neutral, so you don't press more taxes out of the ordinary citizens than before, but um, what you raise in terms of taxing pollutants, basically you give it back to citizens in, in other forms, reducing, for example, taxation of labor. And that was the trick in the German environmental tax reform that uh, also politically, you know, that you, if you would go there and say, look, we increase your tax burden by, in addition to all the taxes that you already pay, we all are now let you pay kind of taxes on fuels and whatever, then would people, people would clearly kind of vote you out of government. And, but if you say, okay, um, our economy becomes less competitiveness, competitive because the labor costs are kind of inflated by all the pension scheme contributions that we have to make. And we, now we tax the environmental bads and reduce the taxation on, on labor. That makes us more competitive and, um, and so, so we, we, and we keep the whole thing uh, revenue neutral. So that trick worked and that was the basis of the environmental tax reform in the, in the past. By the way, uh, the, the chapter on environmental tax reform is co-written by Hans Eichel, who used to be the Minister of Finance in Germany at that time, with my colleague Anna. Um, so, and, and you see um, some examples in developing countries, the Philippines, for example, um, um, reduce income taxes, but then uh, uh, tax coal, etc. Um, the second difference between green and business as usual industrial policy is that green industrial policy makes is not technology neutral. It makes an ex ante dis di di uh, distinction between desirable and not desirable technologies. Usually you would say, um, uh, science and techno technology policy, for example, would encourage new alternative and, and push them in the, at the pre-competitive stage, help them to, to become mature, but then you would leave an, an innovator to the marketplace and whether the innovator with this, this innovation succeeds or, or fails is then an issue of market forces. Well, that's conventional technology policy thinking, but here you clearly make a distinction. You say, we want to have solar energy replacing coal energy, for example. Or we want to replace uh, internal combustion engines with electric engines. Or uh, uh, pesticide-based farming with um, uh, um, organic farming, etc. So we have an ex ante. Di 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 and that has consequences. It means that um, you, uh, you, you're not neutral to the, to the various options but you proactively face certain things that are desirable in and for certain things that are undesirable out. And um, <coughs> this is very interesting of how this can be done because it's always a matter of sequencing, phasing, making pe things politically uh, feasible and that requires kind of a scaled approach. And we have a few of these examples in the report, just one as an illustration here. Um, we have a, a, an energy efficient building scheme in, in Germany where a reference building is defined, techni technically defined, and then kind of more efficient building types are technically defined. That, that says that, that you need to have a standard, a standard here where you clearly define this is the kind of energy efficiency degree of the windows and the, the, the insulation materials and, and whatever, all the materials. And then you need to have testing and laboratories and an accredited standard and an accreditation scheme um, to <coughs> ensure that this building is 70 or 55 or 85, right? And that means working with the standard bodies and so on and with a building code developer, the, the, the building authorities, etc. And then you have a loan subsidy attached, which is basically increasing with, because this is of course more, more costly no, in, the, in the short term, 
And, and then you have a kind of incentive where um, tax rates are, are, are linked to the different degrees of, of, of um, efficiency. And then over time, the whole system moves. Like um, the, 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 the lowest degree of efficiency does not get subsidies. And um, so, so you, you, you move the target up, right? So you define even more. Um, as technology develops, you can de kind of um, develop more efficient building schemes. And then the, 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 the um, subsidy rate is linked to this degree of efficiency. I think this is smart policy making in a way because it basically phases new technologies in, right? And we have other examples, for example, how India uh, introduced kind of a star rating scheme for electric appliances in, in various steps and so on. Then um, a third big difference between business as usual and green industrial policy is that you have an urgency to act. Um, our colleague Hubert Schmitz from IDS, with whom we have worked on many of these projects, has kind of coined this term. It's, it's the first industrial re revolution against the deadline. This, the steam engine industrial re revolution starting in Britain was a market-driven thing. The IT revolution is a market-driven uh, thing. Here we have a technological uh, revolution that is not driven by technological inventions, but by scientific evidence and by policy makers. We cannot proceed along the ways that we have developed in the past. And that's a fundamental difference because we don't have the market forces behind us. So it needs to be a policy-driven process. And, and, um, and what we clearly see particularly, I mean, the, the green has various dimensions. No, it's, it's, uh, I'm talking a lot about decarbonization here, but of course there are other dimensions of green, organic farming and dematerialization in general. But uh, particularly with regard to decarbonization, as you all know, the window of in which we need to act is very, very narrow. We need to really turn economies around. If you think about the picture about the planets, the one and a half planets, et cetera, et cetera we need to uh, turn the system around within the next decade or so, right? And uh, um, that uh, then means that you can't just wait for market forces to develop certain things, but acceleration is the key, the key term here. And, and big push. And that means, for example, with regard to R&D policies, that you may need something like technology missions, like we <coughs> had in the 50s and 60s, mission to the moon and, and nuclear missions, that kind of things, where big pots of monies were kind of put together and the best brains or in, in 10,000 researchers were put together, etc., to give a big push to some technological break, breakthroughs. This has kind of become out of fashion because it's a bit kind of top-down and against markets, search processes, and so on. Um, but, um, but, uh, but we know that we need certain, for a, for a radical turnaround, we need massive improvements in certain areas like energy storage, like smart grids, like second generation biomass, etc., which are essential for, for, for this decarbonization, and we don't have the technologies yet. So, so um, uh, we, we, we probably would need to, to rethink the, the old idea of R&D missions. And some big coordinated endeavors like the German Energiewende and so on. Um, so then another big difference is the increased uncertainties and the longer time horizon of, of change. So we are talking about really uh, decarbonization pathways, for example whereby we think until 2050, 2070 or so, what the targets are then, and how t what kind of roadmaps we would need if at in 2070, for example, we want to be in at a zero emissions economy or so, right? Um, and that is, of course, not synchronized with economic and political planning horizons, which are usually for four years or, or so, no? Or, or uh, the, the long-term loans that banks are giving uh, maybe six, seven, eight years, but, but, but no long-term finance. So that then calls for a kind of societal agreement on long-term roadmaps. So again, it's a, this point about agreeing on the, on the, on the shared uh, vision of the future. And uh, it also um, uh, requires kind of longer-term um, provision of, of, of capital loans, etc. And some instruments that basically uh, lock policy in. So make sure, like the feed-in tariffs, that basically guarantee a certain income for a 
period of 15, 20, in some cases 25 years. So the investor knows this is a guaranteed price. Um, and then if the new government can, can come, come in, it can't revert this, basically. Yeah? Um, so policy lock-in, that, that's uh, one of the things one needs to think about. But then there's a tension also because you also <coughs> need to have some flexibility to re react to technological changes. So there's a trade-off about you know, um, uh, um, 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 a f kind of policy lock-in and flexibility. Then there's a kind of additional point that there are additional policy interfaces. So po green policy making requires strong coordination, for example, with uh, environmental <coughs> policy making. And uh, if you want to, because in many cases what you do is you have uh, sy system sh shifts. The, system, the, the energy system needs to shift, agricultural systems need to shift, transport systems need to shift as systems. It's not about unique technological artifacts that need to change, but it's systemic change. And then that requires kind of a, um, an, a coordinated effort and an example that I would give here, which on paper looks very good, is the German national platform electromobility. It has a strong chancellor's backing. Chancellor said, we, we are not up to date with regard to the transition to electric vehicles. So she basically called four ministries, traffic, environment, um, um, uh, economy, etc., to, to set up a joint secretariat and then involved lots of stakeholders, all the big companies, automotive, chemical, new materials, but also the car drivers lobby, the environmental lobbies, they basically all invite to a, a concerted process to define a roadmap for electrification. And um, <coughs> then the last thing, I said six things are fundamentally different, different if you talk about green industrial policy, is that you are not dealing with national, usually industrial policy is about um, increasing my own nation's competitiveness in the race against my competitors, right? And here you partly deal with global commons and um, like climate and oceans. And that means that you need to have your national green industrial policies where, of course, the strongest driver is the search for national jobs and national competitiveness, but somehow are coordinated to a certain degree with uh, if, it, if, if, if climate and oceans are involved in, in kind of uh, uh, global governance mechanisms like the UNFCCC's technology mechanisms, etc., and, um, and do more collaborative R&D, and then models that we have, like the network of agricultural research institutes, maybe a good governance model that could be applied also for, for green technology, where basically for the last 30 years or so, nations have co-funded agricultural research in, in a worldwide network. So in sum, we're, uh, we're having a situation where the market failure is particularly deep, where you have entrenched societal values involved. So it's not just about an economic transformation and you have unprecedented urgency. And all that calls for a stronger role for governments. And, um, and uh, uh, and in addition to that, um, we need to recognize that it's probably not the environmentalists who will drive the agenda, but it will only happen if you have kind of, if, if you have a credible transformation pathway that creates social and economic benefits for the people. Because neither in Germany nor in Britain nor in Uganda, so people would vote basically for environment on, on, on a, for an environmental agenda. So that leads me to, to the next uh, topic here, which is, uh, what is what's in it for developing country? Is there an economic case for, for going green? <coughs> and this is not trivial. I mean, many people in, in, in the UK and in Germany and, and in OECD countries are now, nowadays convinced that uh, it makes sense to, to have a kind of green innovation agenda. But if you talk to African governments, uh, they are often not, not really, absolutely not convinced. So the, the things that we wanted to tease out of the report is what is the economic rationale for going green? And then there are certain aspects. Um, and there are two chapters in the report that deal with this. Um, the firstly is the obvious thing. that If you deteriorate the planet, if you kill the planet, you will not have an economy in a way. No? And um, 
Um, so that's f fairly obvious, but maybe not convincing for someone who's pursuing a short-term job agenda. So and th another argument that I think will become more relevant for the discourse is that uh, the future switching cost. If you invest now in an oil kind of uh, fossil fuel based power plant and, you, and basically the, you know, the return on investment, you, you maybe you need to have it 20, 30 years running basically to return your, your investment and you, you know that given global trends on decarbonization you may have to switch it off in 15 years time or so then you may, may lose in investors money, right? That's about the carbon bubble <coughs> argument and um, then we have thought about where do you, do you really have this kind of um, lock-in situations and we see two areas where this is really happening, the energy system and urban infrastructure. So if you build cities in the wrong way now, um, you will have big s future switching costs. Then health costs, they are usually not accounted for, but there's a, u a very recent pub publication by the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health that estimates the global costs in, in, uh, for of, of, uh, in, um, health costs of environment pollution at, at 4.6 trillion US dollar per year. That means 6% of the global GDP in terms of health costs. <coughs> this is quite a number, and of course it's kind of an externality that um, policymakers don't see. Um, then you have the argument of enhanced competitiveness. Usually it's easy to convince people like that Denmark can, can uh, gain from going green if they are the early mover that de de develops wind turbine and then they have Vestas, the global leaders in, in wind turbine pr production as an export star company, etc or if you have other countries in Korea and Germany, et cetera, and, and, and the UK, where you can, can reap early mover advantages. But for developing countries, it's more tricky. Usually you, you don't have new to the world type of innovations coming from, from developing uh, countries. But we argue here that there are also um, uh, um, things, for example, in global value chains, if you're an early mover in the adoption of, of food labeling schemes, et cetera, and Kenya does it before Tanzania or Uganda d d do, for example. They, they, they can also reap kind of early mover advantages. And then we have also tried to identify a few sectors in which um, um, low and lower middle income countries can reap new market opportunities. Maybe this is the less interesting part because that's fairly obvious, but this is the less, the less obvious part. So you have even, we, we looked at kind of empirical examples where you see very successful companies in, in low and lower middle income, income countries um, um, exploiting green technology advantages. And that can be in usually low cost products, solar water heaters, solar water pumps, drip irrigation systems, uh, LNG based three wheeler taxis and whatever. That, that's one, that's for national markets maybe, and, and this is kind of inputs for global greener production. So as a, as a participant in global, global value chain, then these countries can use their factor endowments in lithium, rare air, earth, cellulosic ethanol. We have a case study on ethanol production in Brazil, for example, where the <coughs> global trend to greening can be kind of used as a, um, for, for countries that are part of the global supply chain. The same with services also, um, where also you can, um, as a developing country policymaker, I would clearly see kind of, for example, if global producers shift to solar panel manuf manufacturing <coughs> or lithium iron cells for battery, car batteries, etc., there are new um, um, opportunities for low cost manufacturing <coughs> coming up. No? Like what textile wear in the future can be kind of whatever, lithium batteries in the, in the future. <coughs> then there are fiscal benefits. Um, for developing countries, many countries are fossil fuel importers and have kind of very high import bills. And if you reduce um, um, fossil fuels, or, um, you, can, you can improve your import bill and uh, fossil fuel subsidy phase out is also a clearly a win-win uh, sol solution which um, IMF studies for example show how, how 
large uh, the government losses are in, in uh, fossil fuel subsidies. And finally, there's job creation. We have a chapter also written by ILO research department with some uh, university partners from outside. Um, and that's a tricky one because, of course, if you could show that the green transformation creates lots of green job gains, that would be a strong narrative to convince people. But it's methodologically tricky because you don't really have a counterfactual. Of course, you have brown industry losses and you have green industry gains. But to, to really make the calculation and say, like, if we hadn't phased out coal, for example, you know, uh, w how many jobs would we have remain, uh, maintained? And would the coal jobs have been automated away anyway? And, and so on, right? So, so the, 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 the thing is complicated. So what the chapter does is basically it shows methodologically challenge, uh, methodological challenges and then some highlights. There are some aspects like organic agriculture where you ha can make a really safe bet that organic manufacturing is, is more labor intensive than a kind of um, a fossil input and, and fertilizer driven agriculture. Circular economy can be with kind of uh, repairing things rather than uh, throwing them away can be a big job creator. And renewables like uh, solar rooftop systems, etc., are big uh, job creators. So there are certain big jo job creators in the in the green um, in the green field area. So to to end, we have very briefly three slides, and then I'm done um, on on uh, country examples. One is uh, Morocco, where kind of some of the core economic co-benefits that the country can reap is to improve the trade balance and reduce the vulnerabil vulnerability from oil price shocks. So Morocco is blessed with the best wind resources in the world and very, very good solar resources, solar irradiation, and uh, is exploiting this in, 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 in various ways. And uh, so 10 years ago, 99% of energy needs have been covered from imported fossil fuels. That was basically the, the, the biggest drain on fiscal resources. And I don't know where they stand now, but many of the projects are still under construction. But uh, the, the tendency is clearly to, to become much more in energy independent, to have uh, improved energy ac access for rural villages, for example. Um, uh, jobs, I, I don't have the numbers here, but I think they are in the report. In installation maintenance of solar home uh, systems, for example. There's something about technological learning. The universities have created lots of kind of institutes and, and master programs, etc., related to um, uh, renewable um, energy um, technologies. And there are and potentially big locational advantages for energy intensive in industries. For example, phosphate is one of the big resource. Uh, is that Morocco has and, and its processing is very energy intensive and along the coasts the, the wind energy costs are the lowest energy costs worldwide. They're at below three cents per kilowatt hours now because the trade winds are blowing all the time so they have very good um, uh, um, uh, uh, advantage there and I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with to what extent this has been exploited to date. Then uh, there's another example of ethanol in Brazil and another one of, of, of electric vehicles in China. I think you're probably a bit tired now, so <coughs> I, I will skip the Brazil case and maybe just highlight the, the Chinese case on electric vehicles, where, which is clearly a case of industrial policy. <coughs> the Chinese government has a very aggressive push towards electrification of transport, not for climate change and, and, and global warming reasons, but mainly to, to bring down urban air pollution, which is horrible, and really kind of um, creates a lot of critique of the government. And secondly, because um, for 30 years, China has tried to, to kind of gain a foothold in the global car industry and has never achieved it because they have not reached the technological <coughs> sophistication of the, the leading uh, co corporations. But now, kind of electric vehicles in many ways are simpler to produce. You don't need an internal combustion engine, the powertrain. So the, these are the critical things that they have not managed to kind of internalize in the, in the uh, Chinese innovation systems. So they see this kind of as an opportunity to, to leapfrog in the, to the next technologies. And uh, what you see is we have looked at four different markets, and it's, it's really impressive. Yeah, you have 
<coughs> highway capable electric, that's normal electric cars and buses, 330,000, that's the biggest market for electric vehicles worldwide. And buses in particular, there are entire cities that only run on electric buses, and it's a big export item, electric buses to the rest of the world. Um, low speed electric vehicles have come up below the radar of the central government in several provinces, uh, very small vehicles here that are extremely cheap, that have no safety belts, that have no airbags, that have nothing, basically they are kind of a, um, a very, very basic uh, thing. Um, and they, they, they have uh, 600,000 of those vehicles just in one province. It's an enormous market. Um, Electric two-wheelers, 230 million circulating with exports rising. Battery manufacturing, they have lithium reserves, and etc. So there are several really industrial development opportunities related to this. And it's in a way sad to see that the old OECD countries are really lagging behind uh, China in, in this kind of transformative drive. So that's it. And uh, you can s download the report here at that website, and I think on all the websites of the UN agencies here, or our own German Development Institute websites. And uh, I hope uh, I've given some food for thought and for discussion. Thank you, you Tillman. Uh, we do indeed have some time for uh, questions and discussion. <coughs> Uh, so what I'd like to do is take uh, questions, uh, perhaps we'll do it two at a time, and if you, uh, if you put your hand up, and then when, when asked, you can say um, who you are and, and where you're from, and please keep your questions kind of short. And, and I have a few of these short parts of your summits. <coughs> I agree with your definition of industrial policy, which if I can summarize, mm -hmm. is sort of purposively shaping mm -hmm. the economy. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and in that sense, I think we're stuck with the term because that is its legacy term. It has some meaning. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is that it is often interpreted as meaning manufacturing mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And I, I have to say, even in your presentation, where mm -hmm. you were very scrupulous and careful, you did yourself slip from mm -hmm. a slide on industrial policy to one on manufacturing mm -hmm. in your curve of the, mm -hmm. of the yeah, industrialization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do think we have a serious problem here, mm -hmm. um, because that is still a very prominent bit of when you try and reintroduce mm -hmm. a discourse mm -hmm. around industrial and I see two, two problems. The first is a primitive problem. I mean, it's just seen by the traditional manufacturers. Oh, thank God, all that stuff about the new economy, dematerialization, digitalization, greening, has gone. They know that it's really a bad stuff, and we're important, mm. and bring us back and give us more attention. Mm. Um, <coughs> so that's the primitive. And mm -hmm. we're seeing this in the UK, to some mm -hmm. extent the rebirth of industrial policy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, thank God we can get back. And, and if there's any addressing sustainability, it is of the most minimum. Oh, we mm -hmm. will lightweight our vehicles. We will have energy mm -hmm. efficiency, which mm -hmm. we know is not achieving the mm -hmm. decoupling. Mm -hmm. But so that's the primitive level. The more sophisticated level, which takes the green agenda more seriously, 
still then gets hung up on there having to be a manufacturing element. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> if we move to solar power, we've got to make the solar panels ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Germany's mm -hmm. conflict with China on exactly mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. um, if we want a low emission urban transport system, we've got to make electric cars. Now this to me is a very serious problem, both from a, an illusion of every country getting global leadership in the new technology, which mm -hmm. they actually can't, mm -hmm. or secondly, that development means moving towards manufacturing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to me that still remains a big problem, and I want to know, mm -hmm. If you set up um, an industrial policy which creates infrastructure building companies that enable mm -hmm. e-mobility but don't make electric vehicles, mm -hmm. if you create an energy service mm -hmm. industry which doesn't make a single solar panel but actually installs and makes low carbon economy, is this or is this not mm -hmm. a viable mm -hmm. industrial mm -hmm. policy for development? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, quite complex. <laughs> um, maybe I start with, with, with your question as well. Um, so, do you see m aggregate effects on, on, on growth from, from greening? And as we are at the very beginning of the process, and, and, and um, I, I think um, we can't really honestly answer that on an evidence based on an evidence basis. I mean. Um, the, the green fiscal stimulus package that, for example, the U.S. and other countries have enacted after the fiscal uh, crisis was, was the idea was really to make uh, um, green investments an innovation driver, right? To, to, to in invest in something that's not yet existing and to kind of push money into the, the economy. That has been a, a big investment program which has now been phased out. Um, to what extent that has aggregate growth effects and kind of a net growth effects compared to kind of the old pathway, I think that would be um, not not really be honest to try to, to make an estimation there. No? I don't. Maybe maybe others can comment on that um, who have been modeling pathways and so on. But um, your question on industrial policy: yes and no. Um, firstly. Clearly, we make an explicit statement, uh, this is not about industrial policy in terms of, of manufacturing. Um, the, Brit the, the British and German term for industrial policy also are different in a way. For example, in, it's here you, in English, you s talk about agro-industry, software industry, etc. So industry is a way of producing and it's not related to manufacturing industry, no? In that sense, I think it's about um, uh, using the principles of mass production and, and um, um, uh, specialization, et cetera, which have brought about productivity growth and, and but using this across sectors. And um, in, in German, industrial is manufacturing, so it's synonymous, and that's why it's even diff more difficult to <laughs> to argue against this kind of narrow definition. But clearly our statement is it's not about industrial policies. And this is why we had a certain dispute with this organization here, UNIDO, which basically withdrew its contributions in the first phase to this report because they said it's about manufacturing. And we said, no, it's not. If you want to dematerialize the economy, it's about new business models. So um, in your example of ca having a, whatever, a business model for car sharing or, or whatever that may reduce the, the, the demand for cars, but kind of can be a growth enhancer, that's the kind of thing that we have in mind. Having said this, um, I think that in manufacturing industry does matter. I mean, there have been these old debates about, there was a famous book, Manufacturing Matters, because manufacturing is, has been a driver of productivity growth in the past. On average, productivity is higher in manufacturing than it is in agriculture and, and services. And um, 
So the uh, kind of uh, modern complex of manufa smart manufacturing with related services, engineering services, etc., usually is a core thing, and that maybe um, has been, I mean, if you compare Germany and Britain, etc., um, there was a big debate in Germany about whether we are over-industrialized when the UK was growing faster since the fiscal uh, uh, crisis. Uh, the, uh, I think the, the debate has turned around. Now you are discussing whether you shouldn't have uh, de de-industrialized so far. And I think um, I'm convinced that an industrial core is, is relevant because it creates spin-offs. If you're a coffee growing economy or whatever, um, the opportunities to diversify your knowledge assets is not as big as if you are a machine tool manufacturer or so, because one thing leads to another. There's these concepts of by Hausmann and others about economic proximity that basically say if you have these industries there at the core, then you, you can easily create other industries. And manu manufacturing there has a, has a key role to play. So I, I'm convinced. But then the green economy will be an economy that re needs manufactured goods. No? It's a matter of how you produce them and what kind of things you produce, whether you produce a solar panel and an electric vehicle that is powered with solar energy, or you produce in kind of old-fashioned vehicles and old-fashioned power plant. Um, so, uh, yeah, maybe that's, that's all I can say. Okay, we've got time for uh, at least two more. I'll take uh, Paul and uh, you're the front. Yeah, Tillman, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. That's uh, really, really interesting. And I look forward to going to this. This goes back a bit to the first question. Mm -hmm. Because, um, I mean, uh, I, I don't have any trouble arguing, either when I'm teaching or, or writing, that if you're convinced of the environmental mm -hmm. imperative, mm -hmm. as probably most people in this room are, um, we've now got to the stage where it doesn't need to cost a lot. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there may mm -hmm. be net benefits there. Mm -hmm. There are benefits of arguing. And that, I think, mm -hmm. is now very, very robust. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most people are not yet convinced of the environmental mm -hmm. imperative, definitely in mm -hmm. African ministries mm -hmm. and finance. Mm -hmm. From your discussions with them, how close are they to recognizing that even if they only <coughs> care about the economic imperative, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. more or less mm -hmm. is where they are, actually it's worth them looking at some of these environmental industries because mm -hmm. that is where mm -hmm. they will find mm -hmm. more economically beneficial mm -hmm. yeah. uh, mm -hmm. applications, mm -hmm. and then there'll be some environmental co-benefits which mm -hmm. they may or may mm -hmm. not care about. Yeah. I'm just wondering about you know, the messaging of yeah. this and, and, and to what extent that second <coughs> argument is, is remotely credible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Arthur Gagat, postgraduate, mm -hmm. uh, international public policy. Yeah, uh, point number six, the uh, difference between green, green industrial policy and mm -hmm. business as usual. Was it dealing with global commons? I'm not sure what mm -hmm. it was. And there's another one. It's a biopolicy's res restraint book. It's about choke points, about all those, the oceans and the good commons. Mm -hmm. My question is, does green industrial policy take into account foreign policy implications, foreign policy um, mm -hmm. uh, analysis? Because uh, there's no way you can have policy green policy without taking into account that some nations may occupy certain choke points, thus uh, complicating matters in green energy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. green policy. So and what choke points? Choke points, uh, basically like Suez, Suez, uh, Shaker Formos, Malacca Straits. Okay. Ah, okay. Uh, okay. That's, that's not like that's the that, 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 that was the term was um, mm -hmm. uh, pushed by MIT's Barry Fossil in the book mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, on Paul's uh, question, uh, I'm afraid that uh, uh, I mean the discourse is there. The last. Um, UN Economic Commission's uh, on Africa's report was on, on, on greening Africa's industries. So there is a debate about these things and, and uh, um, things are moving. It's, we are kind of much further ahead. But then at the, at the normal level in the ministries, people are still kind of not, not believing in the, in the benefits. I think we are not, not yet there. This said, may, there may be some exceptions. For example, rural electrification. That's one thing where, uh, where I think everyone sees a big, big potential because uh, you have seen the, um, uh, uh, the costs of, of decentralized energy on the basis of renewables coming down very rapidly. And that is a way of electrifying regions that would never be, have been connected to the 
the grid in the next 10 or 15 years. And what I find quite striking is that um, an electrification is a big driver of development. So with electrification comes uh, refrigeration and that has an effect on hygiene and, and, and child mortality and maternal uh, mortality and on body mass index. And there's a lot of evidence showing that if you electrify, um, human development indexes go up. You know? it's, it's like education and electrification are the big drivers of, of human development. And it, it becomes cheaper now in decentralized locations and small island states and, and rural areas and etc. And, and, and India, for example, will probably <coughs> be fully, uh, will have the, the rate of access to energy in India. There were, were like 600 million people in India not connected to the grid in 2000. And in 2025, every Indian will be connect, will be, will be have access to electricity. And that's um, a, a huge driver of, of development. And that has to do with, of course, industrial development potential directly with the renewables um, as an energy creation, but then all the indirect spillover effects that you can then start to industrialize, have access to information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Africa is not moving much, so, so the, the, the number of non-connected household, households in Africa will increase according to IEA projections. No? But that is, that is one of the points, the easy entry points, where you can, can convince African policymakers that there's a lot of, of things to gain. And your question, um, maybe can you, can you ask it again? Does foreign policy complicate green industrial policy, especially yeah, yeah. in the global commons? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's no incentive to invest in global commons. Um, what, what, we, what we see is there have been processes like um, the, the, the German feed-in tariff has been called a gift to the world because German, German um, energy users paid an, an, an extra price for their energy which brought solar panel costs down and made it affordable, affordable to the rest of the world. I see the same happening with electric vehicles in China now. China is kind of investing so much in bringing down the costs of, of, of electric vehicles that we will soon have, uh, basically the break even will be reached much sooner due to a national strategy of the Chinese government. So it's a Chinese gift to the world in a way. But these are kind of coincidental. The, the Germans haven't done it to, to please the rest of the world and the Chinese are not doing it to please the rest of the world. These are beneficial spillovers, unintended spillovers in a way. What we would need in principle is something like a, a coordinated thing like we, we, the world needs energy storage technologies. Let's have a coordinated policy push to that. And I don't see this a strong incentive. This incentive could be the Paris Declaration, where countries, basically the, the developing countries, mainly committed to a decarbonization agenda against the promise of tr financial transfers and technology transfer from the rich world. There's a lot of lip service, I, I, I would say, but I think what we need to have is kind of more accountability mechanisms to really make sure that this kind of technology transfer happens. Because if not, there is no, no incentive for, for, like if, you, if you're the patent holder and you reap innovation rents from something you have developed at home, there's no reason for, for sharing it. You know? But there are ways like, in, like patent rules for HIV uh, AIDS um, uh, medicines, for example, where there's a global governance regulation and one could think about ways of transferring these lessons to, to international technology sharing. Hmm. I think we have time for one last 
Mm -hmm. the next day, my whole right, right, day right, right, right. So what okay. the board says about that? Uh, three mm -hmm. question, three points. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, you're right. First question, so, so uh, for didactic reasons, it's easier to talk about green sectors where you can, t t this is the brown, this is the green. Most sectors are, are kind of gradual improvements of energy efficiency, resource efficiency, etc. And that is, most of the story is about the gradual changes, uh, but um, uh, that's more difficult to kind of convey in a story for a broad audience, but, but, but you're right. Um, and that's why, for example, it's so difficult to count green jobs, no? for example. But, but uh, we make the statement in various sections there. Um, uh, the second is on, on ca capacity building, how to do it. I think the how to do it in green industrial policy is then, other than mind being setting up a, a, a cap and trade system for, for carbon price or pricing or so, is, is, is pretty much <coughs> what we know about industrial policy, no? about what smart industrial policy I is about university enterprise linkages. I had one slide of what are good principles of policy making to encourage competition among service providers, to hold service providers accountable, to have cle clearly m m m m m monitoring uh, systems in place and, and have sunset clauses for, 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 for um, um, subsidy regimes, etc. So that kind of things. And, uh, but then the, the t kind of, if the spirit is this, in this longish definition, you know, it's about creating consensus, etc. Then we have some examples, like, like for example, how the German energy transition has been enacted. No? How stakeholders have, which stakeholders have been brought together. How road mapping has been happening. Also, how in the, in the, there's a chapter on phasing in and phasing out. That's fairly specific about how you kind of in which policy sequences you can go about you know, uh, phasing certain things out. For example, in, in electric vehicles also, you, then you can ha have a, a fleet emission standard a regulation at the EU level, and all countries now have it. And where, where year by year, you, you kind of bring down the allowed um, levels of CO2 emissions, etc. No? So there are regulatory things, there are, um, there's an example of phasing in, 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 in electric appliances in India, maybe that's the last example, where um, there was no star rating for electric efficient, uh, uh, kind of high and le low levels of energy efficiency of electric appliances like air conditioners, etc. So there was a, an alliance with the five big manufacturers of these goods where the Indian government said, why don't you introduce a voluntary rating in your five companies and then when, when you have reached 50% market penetration, we make it mandatory, we make it a law, right? So that these are smart ways of introducing them. There are some, some examples of that kind of, of creating capabilities, institutional setups throughout the report. Yeah. And more over. Okay, I'm afraid glass, right? I know there are more questions, uh, but we have to leave it there. Uh, but you can join us upstairs for some drinks and nibbles and ask your questions uh, there. Um, so uh, before we end, I'd just like us all to thank Tillman, once again, mm -hmm. for a fascinating talk and stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.